just to set the context, deep learning is really causing a machine learning revolution. So this is a graph of interest in the term deep learning uh, from about 2010 to present. And you can see that it's gone uh, up tremendously. Uh, research in the field of machine learning has also been progressing extremely rapidly. So if you look at the number of machine learning oriented archive papers per year, uh, we're now up to a rate of about 50 per day. Uh, which is quite a lot of work to keep up with. That's actually growing faster than Moore's law of uh, doubling every two years. And I'm not quite sure what we will do in a few years, but at the moment, uh, it's pretty hard to keep up even where we are today. Um, here's a graph of NIPS, which is a major machine learning conference registration uh, by year, where zero is the end of the pre-registration period and the opening of regular registration. Uh, and the years sort of go up uh, this way, and that's this year. Uh, I hope you got your ticket early because otherwise, no ticket for you. Uh, which has led people to create some uh, cartoonish uh, projections based on this. Um, <laughs> this was actually done before, after last year's registration, not this year's, so it perhaps needs some updating. Um, so, you know, lots of graphs, many of them going up. Why? And the real reason is that um, deep learning, which is essentially a rebranding of the term artificial neural network, uh, is this technique that can be used in, to solve a variety of different problems, as you'll see in this talk. And really, it's a collection of simple, trainable mathematical units organized in a layer-wise fashion so that you build these automatic hierarchical representations where higher layers build on the things that lower layers have learned uh, that all work together to solve really complicated tasks. Um, so these techniques have actually been around since the 70s and 80s and were very exciting in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, so what's new? Uh, one is we have some new insights into the kinds of network architectures and the way to connect these, these kind of primitive units together. Uh, we have some new algorithms that are better at sort of doing the optimization process. Uh, but really, we have a lot more scale. We have a lot more computational ability today. We have a lot more interesting large data sets that we care about. Um, but one of the real benefits of these approaches is that they really can learn from very raw, heterogeneous kinds of data. You can put in very raw forms of data, like pixels of an image or you know, audio waveforms of a sound. And you don't need to explicitly engineer higher level features from those raw pixels or raw, raw data forms. So um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, this is probably not necessary in this audience, but you know, here's a very simple cartoonish diagram of how a neural net works and how one trains them to do a task. So let's say we want to be able to take a picture and distinguish if that picture is one of a cat or one of a dog. Um, so we might have a bunch of training images where someone has gone through and said, that's a cat, that's a dog, that's a cat, cat, dog. And the way we're going to train this, process, this model is we're going to feed in the raw pixels of, of one of these images. And some of these neurons that have interesting pattern detections will fire, and some will not. So maybe some of them will fire when there's a splotch of brown. Another one will fire when there's an edge of disorientation, kind of in the first layer. And then as you go up through this model, higher level features will fire based on combinations of those lower level features. So now you have a splotch of brown with a, you know, a darkish tinge on one side, or you have uh, a corner, or things like that. And as you get very close to the top, you have all these nice features that you can then use to make a prediction of, is this a cat or a dog? And if you make the correct prediction, you're done in the training process. If you make the wrong prediction, then through the magic of a backpropagation algorithm, you can essentially figure out how to adjust the units in, throughout the model so that the next time you see this example, you're more likely to give the correct answer than the incorrect one. And more, more importantly, when you see an image like this one, you're more likely to give the correct answer and not the wrong one. So that you want to generalize. Obviously, you don't want to just learn how to do it for a specific set of these 10,000 images, but to do it for any image. OK, so what are some examples of things you can learn with the neural net? So I already told you, you can put in pixels and get out a categorical thing, like it's a lion. Uh, it turns out it, can't, it can be not just two categories, like cat or dog, but perhaps one of 20,000 different categories. Cat, dog, Doberman Pinscher, 
fire truck, aircraft carrier, lots of different things. You can put in audio, audio waveforms, a time sequence of the, the sound, and get out a transcript of what is being said. How cold is it outside? You can put in a sentence in one language, hello, how are you, and get out a translation of that sentence, bonjour, comment allez-vous? And the system can learn from observations how to do that process. Somewhat surprisingly, you can put in pixels of an image and get out not just a category, but an actual sentence that describes the scene in that image, a blue and yellow train traveling down the tracks. So that's pretty surprising to me. A few years ago, I would have said, I don't think computers can do that anytime soon. But they can actually do a, a pretty serviceable job of captioning an image from the, the raw pixels. So why is this happening now? Right? Why do we see the growth of all these different things? Machine learning archive papers, NIPS registration, um, lots of things. So in the 80s and 90s, neural nets were, were a thing, and were, people were excited about them. Uh, but other approaches at that time just provided better accuracy for problems we cared about. Neural nets really couldn't uh, deal with this, even this, the problems we wanted to solve in, at that time. Uh, I actually did an undergraduate thesis on parallel training of neural nets in 1990 because I was really intrigued by the abstraction they provided. And I felt like if we could just get a bit more computation you know, uh, on a 64 processor machine, maybe we get a 60x speed up and then we could solve lots and lots of problems. Um, uh, it turned out what we needed was like a million x more compute, not 60x. Uh, but the good news is, thanks to Moore's law, here we are. And now neural nets are actually uh, outperforming other approaches for problems uh, that we were already kind of solving. And they're also enabling us to solve problems that we didn't know how to solve in any other way. So that's why there's so much excitement about this. Um, just in the field of computer vision, if you look at uh, the improvement in the uh, winning error rate for a, a, a popular image contest that's run every year called the ImageNet Challenge run by Stanford, um, in 2011, the winning entry did not use a neural net and got 26% error rate. Uh, we know that the error rate on this task for humans is about 5% because uh, Andre Karpathy, one of the Stanford graduate students who administers this contest, um, actually subjected himself to 120 hours of training on images himself. So he went home and like looked at images and said, <laughs> yes, that's a Doberman Pinscher. Yes, yes, it's a you know, Secretary of State. <laughs> um, and uh, then he subjected himself to a bunch of test images that he'd never seen before. And he got 5% error on those test images. And he had another lab mate who was not as diligent and did only 10 hours of training and got 12% error. So this is a pretty hard task. And where we are now is that the winning entry in 2016 got 3% error, right? So think about that. Five years, a huge improvement, right? Like from barely being able to see, probably not even really being able to see, to now we can see and do this task better than humans. That's really important, right? The fact that computers can now see, uh, that, that's transformative in many different ways. Um, if you think about the time in sort of evolutionary biology when animals developed eyes, that's where we are in computing. Okay. So I'm going to frame some of the rest of the talk in terms of how these newfound capabilities are going to allow us to tackle or help to tackle some of these big challenges that the National Academy of Engineering put out a list of 14 challenges for the 21st century. Um, I think machine learning will actually help with many, many of these. In this talk, I'm going to focus on just a few of them. Um, and I like these challenges. These are sort of you know, what we should aspire to as a society. They're how can we make people healthier? How can we make people happier? How can we discover new things more quickly? You know, these are, are nice aspirational kinds of challenges. OK, so let's go through a few of these and talk about how machine learning, and in particular deep learning, can be used to, to really advance the state of the art in some of these fields. OK, one of the most obvious is restore and improve urban infrastructure. And um, obviously, autonomous cars are going to be a really big factor in this. If you have autonomous cars, it really transforms the way you might think about designing cities, the way that we get around. It will suddenly mean that people who 
are too elderly and no longer can drive a normal car, can, can have mobility, uh, children can have mobility even before they can drive, this would be very transformative. And it's obviously a very difficult problem, right? Because you need to be able to take in raw perceptual data from the car. It has a bunch of sensors on it, it has cameras, it has LIDAR, which gives you kind of 3D uh, point clouds of data, um, it has maybe radar, and you need to be able to make sense of it uh, to the level that you can understand what all the different objects are in your scene and know how they're likely to behave in the near future and how you should react, right? So that's fundamental, but being able to see from those raw sensors to building this high-level view of the world is clearly going to be or is really important for building a safe autonomous vehicle. Um, another area I'm particularly excited about is the use of machine learning to augment our human abilities to provide uh, healthcare. So um, we've been doing a little bit of work in several different uh, healthcare-related problems in our group. Uh, the screen is a bit stretched. Your eyeballs are not normally quite that shape. But um, uh, so one of the problems that we've been doing work in is uh, the problem of diagnosing a disease called diabetic retinopathy. And the way that an ophthalmologist does this is they have a retinal image like this, and they can look at this retinal image and give it a grade of one, two, three, four, or five. Um, now it turns out that ophthalmologists are not particularly, uh, uh, they don't necessarily agree with each other very, well, very often. So if you ask two ophthalmologists to grade the same image, they give the same number 60% of the time, right? which is a pretty big deal because the difference between a two and a three is kind of like, yeah, yeah, go away and come back next year versus, you, oh, we should get you in next week and, and start giving you treatment. So this is a big deal. If you ask the same ophthalmologist to grade the same image a few hours later, they agree on the number 65% of the time. <laughs> right? So that, that should scare you, I think. Um, so we decided we would try to train a machine learning model now that vision works uh, to essentially do this task. Go from retinal images to a grade of one, two, three, four, or five. In order to collect a set of training data, we got about 150,000 of these retinal images. We had them graded by seven ophthalmologists each because that reduces the variance. You can say, oh, it's more like a two than a three because five people said two and two people said three. Um, and we now have, uh, this is work published by our group uh, in uh, JAMA, the end of last year, uh, a model that gets a higher F score than the median board certified ophthalmologist. Um, and we're now uh, in collaboration with our Verily subsidiary licensing this to an ophthalmology camera manufacturer. And we're also doing clinical trials in India in a network of eye hospitals. Um, and this is a particularly important problem because this disease is very treatable if you catch the problem in time, but if you don't, then you can go blind. And in many parts of the world, there just aren't enough ophthalmologists to assess the retinal images. The actual camera to take the images is relatively inexpensive. So you can imagine going to a village, taking a thousand, you know, pictures of a thousand people, and then using this algorithm to then figure out which people need follow-up treatment. Um, you see similar stories in many other areas of medical imaging. Uh, so our group has also been doing work on pathology, uh, where we're trying to do breast cancer uh, uh, pathology uh, image localization, trying to identify which parts of a, of a uh, cell, of a s uh, scanned image have um, uh, tumorous material. Uh, and there we're getting better results than a human trained pathologist with actually relatively small amounts of training data. So only 270 training images although these are pathology slides, so they're very large. So they're 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. Uh, and uh, not on our group. This is work out of the Karolinska Institute in Sweden has been doing some very nice work in radiology, uh, getting sort of similar things where they're seeing you know, as good or slightly better uh, performance um, than, than human physicians. OK, so uh, medical imaging seems uh, well on its way to being uh, sort of transformed by this new approach. Um, another thing we've been thinking about in our group is uh, sort of more abstract predictive tasks for healthcare. So given a patient's medical record, can we predict what's going to happen to this patient in the future? Um, I'm going to now take a detour through some deep learning work that our group has been doing 
on other sequential prediction tasks, in particular translation from one language to another. And then we'll come back to this and show you how it can be used for medical records. Okay, so uh, in 2014, Ilya Sutzgaver, Oriol Vinyals, and Kwok Lee in our group. Oh. I kind of liked it, but whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, developed this idea of a model called a sequence to se sequence to sequence model. So the idea is you take in one sequence and then you want to predict another sequence conditioned on that first sequence. Um, so that sounds kind of abstract, but if you frame machine translation as I have a, a bunch of training data that is say English, say French sentences in this case, uh, and the corresponding in English sentence, and I train the model so that when it sees a French sentence, it spits out the corresponding English sentence, uh, and it can generalize to new sentences, then all of a sudden you've built a machine translation system, right? Uh, and so uh, that's what we did uh, in scaling this to get it to work on the full Google Translate uh, data set um, with you know, a large number of co-authors. Um, and you know, in reality, it's not quite as clean. It's a more complicated model. It has a lot of these kind of sequential prediction layers. Uh, it has something called an attention mechanism where not, you don't just keep a state that you update, you keep all the states and then you can refer back to other previous states uh, when you're translating a sentence for the target language. You can look back at this part of the sentence in the source language and the representation you've learned. Um, and then you train this at a large scale, so we stamp out lots of copies of this and use you know, maybe 100 GPUs or 200 GPUs to train uh, one of these models for a week. Um, but the results are pretty startling. So the blue line here, the, this is an evaluation of translation quality for different language pairs. The blue line is the old Google Translate system, which was not a deep learning based model. It was essentially uh, a bunch of simpler statistical models of things like a target language model of how often every five word sequence occurs in English and an alignment model for how words in English and French sentences align, and a phrase table and a dictionary, and then 500,000 lines of code to glue that together. So that's the blue line. Uh, the green line is the new deep learning based system, which is expressed using 500 lines of TensorFlow code, um, and trained on lots and lots of example pairs of English and French sentences, or English and whatever sentences. And you see the quality jump is quite significant. Um, and the yellow line there is the quality of translations by bilingual humans as judged by other humans. So you can see for some language pairs, we're actually getting pretty close to that. Um, and for some, we're still pretty far away. The interesting thing is for some of these language pairs, it's computationally expensive enough that we could only get through one sixth of our training data. So we know that for machine learning models, if you can go through all the data instead of part of the data, it just generally gets better. So we're pretty hopeful that we'll continue to make pretty significant improvements here. Um, when we released this in Japan, uh, we are, we're actually trying to do this kind of quietly, but uh, lots of the old system in Japanese was actually quite bad for translation. And uh, lots of people in Japan noticed this, and it was the number one trending item on Twitter in Japan for like an entire day. Uh, and so a Japanese uh, linguistics professor uh, actually noticed this and did some analysis. And in particular, he took this first paragraph of the novel, The Snows of Kilimanjaro by Hemingway, and he fed it through the English to Japanese and then from the Japanese back to English to see what he got. And this is the old system. Uh, let's just focus on the last sentence. Uh, whether the leopard had what the demand at that altitude, there is no that nobody explained. Totally crystal clear, right? There's, there's a leopard, but you can't really tell much else is, is going on. Uh, so the new system uh, said no one can explain what leopard was seeking at that altitude, which is pretty close. It left out the word though. But other than that, that's a completely faithful representation of the original uh, thing. And you can see it got the entire paragraph right except for the word A in the previous sentence. So this has gone from like not really usable to pretty darn good. Another interesting thing we did was we uh, 
want it, since Google supports 100 different languages, that's a, about 10,000 language pairs we need to support. We didn't really want to train 10,000 separate models. Um, so we started to investigate having a single model that could translate between several different languages in arbitrary combinations. And one of the things we did was, as an experiment, we trained this model on English, Japanese, and Korean, where we only exposed it to sentence pairs where English was on one of the sides. So English to Japanese, English to Korean, and Korean to English, and Japanese to English. Um, and what we found was that the system could actually do a serviceable job of translating between Japanese and Korean, and Korean and Japanese, even though it had never been exposed to training data of that form. Um, and so that, uh, the, in this paper, we go into some analysis of why that is. But essentially, the internal representation that we've built of a sentence is roughly the same regardless of the surface syntax or surface input language. You get to the same point in this very high dimensional representation of the meaning of a sentence regardless of the input. Uh, OK. So now, back to healthcare. Um, so if you imagine a sequential prediction problem, which is I have some sequence of medical record data for a patient, and now I want to predict the rest of it, or predict high-level attributes about the, the future of it. Um, you can imagine that being able to answer these kinds of questions with a model would be quite useful. Uh, in particular, one that I think is interesting would be, what are the likely diagnoses for this patient, given all that we know about the patient? You know, their current reporting problems, but also their past history. Um, uh, what kind of medication might you consider? You know, what tests should be ordered for this patient? Uh, we think this can be a really complementary tool for physicians to say, oh yeah, here's, we think this is 95% likely, but here's this 2% alternative that you might want to consider, and you might want to do some additional tests or, or think about, uh, you know, could it be this instead of that? Okay. Um, another one of the grand challenges was engineer better medicines. And actually, a lot of them relate to being able to just understand chemical properties. So uh, we've been doing a little bit of work in our group on uh, quantum chemistry. And in particular, uh, one kind of problem that quantum chemists deal with is they want to be able to put in a molecule or a compound and then predict properties of that. Uh, and one of the ways that they do this is with a uh, very computationally intensive simulator called density functional theory simulations, uh, which are essentially these things that run for maybe an hour, and then you get out the, the data you want about these, these chemical properties, these you know, 13 or 15 numbers. Um, so an interesting thing that we've been able to do is to take that simulator and to train a neural net to learn what the simulator is doing. So you can use the input and output data from the simulator as training data for a neural network. And so we now have essentially a new kind of network architecture that uh, uh, my colleagues came up with um, in order to do uh, these kinds of chemistry uh, problems. And then we try to predict uh, the same properties using the simulator as the ground truth. And the interesting thing is that you can't tell the difference in accuracy, essentially. And we have something that's 300,000 times faster. Uh, and so you can imagine if you're a chemist, you know, if you have a, a, a thing that's 300,000 times faster, that will dramatically change the way you do research. You suddenly might screen 100 million compounds and find the 10,000 that are most interesting based on that, and then maybe explore those further with the, the DFT simulator or in real life in a, in a real lab. Um, and that really just is an interesting shift in how you might do chemistry. And we've noticed this property in other scientific domains as well, where you have a really extensive computation that you care about that maybe is a simulator of some process or something like that. Uh, we have a colleague who's visiting us from Harvard who does earthquake si simulation. And he had a computation that does a million CPU hour simulation of a slip fault in Japan. And uh, he took the inner loop of that computation and replaced it with like the world's lamest neural net. It's a four-layer neural net with 10 neurons per layer. Um, and this, 
the simulator ran 100,000 times faster, and he couldn't tell the difference in accuracy. Right? And so that is, again, another one of these stories where you now have a much faster, more lightweight computational tool at your disposal. OK. Um, another one of the grand challenges was engineer the tools for scientific discovery, which sounds pretty broad. So let me talk about a few of the tools that we've been building for doing machine learning, which we think is a, you know, going to be a significant part of a lot of scientific discovery in the future. Um, so one of the first things we've been doing is building software for our own research purposes. And um, about uh, almost two years ago now, we uh, decided that the second generation of the software that we've built, uh, a system called TensorFlow, we would release an open source uh, so that uh, essentially the rest of the community can uh, sort of help us improve it and benefit from, from the work that we've done. Uh, we released it with an Apache 2.0 license, which I'm not a lawyer, but pretty much means you can take it and do pretty much whatever you want with it, uh, which is nice. So the goals that we had were that we want to establish a common way of expressing machine learning ideas so that when you publish a paper, uh, sometimes you'll publish you know, the executable code for the experiments in the paper so that you can reproduce the results, or other people can you know, take that idea and modify it and try out different, different ideas. Uh, and by open sourcing it, that means that it's not just people within Google who can do this, but anyone uh, around the world can do this. And we want to make it both a platform that's really good at expressing research ideas, so it's very flexible and easy to use, but also that is robust enough to scale to large data sets to be able to take a model you've trained and run it you know, wherever machine learning needs to be run in your environment. And um, so TensorFlow has been pretty successful in our minds. Uh, we've got a pretty vibrant community externally. So um, it's hosted on an open source hosting facility called GitHub, uh, which has got lots of different, it's got you know, tens of millions of uh, open source repositories of various kinds. Uh, and when you're interested in a repository on GitHub, you can star it. And so it's like one kind of vague metric of interest in a repository. Uh, and you can see that TensorFlow, uh, as measured by GitHub stars, is, is off to a good start. Uh, and that's a comparison with a bunch of other kind of open source machine learning packages of various kinds. Uh, it actually passed Linux a number of stars about uh, six months ago we were excited about. Um, here's just a few stats. You know, I, one of the things that I think has helped is we've been continuously improving TensorFlow, as have a bunch of external contributors, adding features that you know, people care about. Uh, other people have been adding features that make it run on different kinds of platforms that we don't necessarily have access to. Uh, and it's pretty active project as these projects go. So there's about a thousand code changes per month. Um, there's lots of people doing things outside of the core repository, creating their own repositories with examples of things that they've done in, uh, you know, their class classes or in their research. So there's 16,000 other GIF GitHub repositories now with TensorFlow code in them. And universe, different universities are starting to use this in their own machine learning classes as the way to express some of the machine learning concepts they're trying to teach. OK, another really important trend for uh, machine learning and computer architecture is that deep learning is really transforming how we build com computing devices um, for two reasons. So one is uh, deep learning has two really important properties. One is that they're very tolerant of reduced precision. So it's enough to do kind of very rough calculations to one digit of precision or two, not to six or seven. And that just means that you can fundamentally do much more efficient computations because you can squeeze in more multipliers and adders in the same amount of chip area. Um, and the other property it has is that all the models I've shown you are composed of a handful of specific operations. Generally, you know, matrix multiplies, vector arithmetic, uh, linear, essentially a handful of linear algebra operations. So if you can make computers that can do reduced precision linear algebra and nothing else, that's incredibly useful for all the machine learning work that I've, I've shown you and for a bunch of other ones as well. Uh, so we've actually been doing this for quite a while now. Uh, we started 
uh, maybe uh, three and a half years ago, four years ago, to uh, build custom chips for doing machine learning models. And this is the first chip that we built, uh, which has now been in our data centers for about 30 months. Um, it's used on every search query. It's used for the machine translation work I showed you. It was used for the AlphaGo match uh, in Korea um, and many other things. Uh, and this first chip was targeted at inference, when you already have a trained model and you just want to apply it to, you know, now I have a new sentence. What's the translation of that sentence? Or, you know, I have a board position in Go. What moves should I consider making here? Or, you know, uh, other kinds of things like that. What, you know, I have an image model. What is this image? Um, and there was a paper about that chip at ISCA this year with uh, those four authors plus 50 others. Or something. So that first chip, we tackled inference first because it's a little bit easier problem. Um, but what we really care about is training. You know, the ultimate thing that we want is to be able to have a machine learning idea, train a model with that idea, and see if it works. And to do that as quickly as possible. And to do it at scale, not just on a small problem, but on some problem with a relatively large amount of data. So the second generation of this uh, sort of line of, of chips that we've built is uh, what we call tensor processing unit version two. And it's designed for both training and inference. Um, so that's a picture of a board. If you zoom in on one of the chips, the chip essentially is designed around doing really big multiplies really quickly. So it has a 128 by 128 two-dimensional matrix unit. And every clock cycle, you do uh, you know, 128 times 128 multiplies, multiply adds. Uh, it also has a scalar unit to do other kinds of uh, non-matrix-oriented computations. Um, and it has a little bit reduced precision uh, compared to full IEEE floating point, but it's fine for neural nets. And a single chip is 45 teraflops of computation, which is a fair amount. Uh, and then when you put it in a board, uh, that gives you 180 teraflops on a board with a lot of memory bandwidth, so uh, 2.4 terabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Um, and that's a pretty good, healthy amount of compute. Uh, but they're designed to be connected together into bigger configurations. And so uh, <laughs> this is what we call a pod, which is essentially four racks. Two racks have the specialized chips, and the other two racks are sort of support uh, traditional server machines. Um, and so that's 64 of those boards with 11 and a half petaflops of compute. Uh, and a lot of memory bandwidth. And so we're, we're pretty excited about the kinds of problems that these enable us to tackle. Uh, because, for example, we'll be able to get through all the translation data now uh, and uh, to try new ideas more quickly. And um, that's one instance, and it's pretty easy to put lots of these in a data center. Um, now, normally, programming a supercomputer is kind of annoying. Uh, and so these are designed to be programmed via TensorFlow. So essentially, you express a machine learning computation you want to do uh, via TensorFlow. And then with relatively minor changes, that program will run on CPUs or on GPUs or on these new TPUs. Um, and we're also going to be making these available through our cloud product. So uh, external people can then uh, run their own machine learning workloads on this, this thing. You can essentially get a virtual machine with one of these devices attached. Uh, we're also going to be, uh, we know a lot of other people external to Google are compute limited. Like they have ideas that require a lot of computation and they're sort of limited in how effectively they can try out those ideas. So we're going to be making a thousand of these available for free to top uh, researchers who are committed to essentially using these devices, giving us feedback about you know, how well they work, and also openly publishing the results of that work. Um, and we're excited to see what kinds of things people will do. Um, let's see. So one of the things about TensorFlow is that it's designed to run in lots of different environments. So we want to be able to run computations in all the heterogeneous places that machine learning will need to be able to be run. So it runs on you know, mobile phones, iOS and Android. It runs on Raspberry Pi. It runs on these TPUs, CPUs, GPUs. Uh, we're also somewhat language agnostic, so other people 
in the external community and, and internally have added different front ends for TensorFlow so that people can express TensorFlow uh, computations in a variety of different languages. The Python front end is definitely the most fully developed. The SQL plus one is pretty good. And the other ones have varying levels of, of support from like fairly minimal, you can get something running but it's not fully featured to, to more uh, fleshed out ones. So the central idea behind a TensorFlow program is that it creates a computational graph of the computation that you want to perform. So this is a Python uh, use of TensorFlow. And from that, we can then uh, discern, uh, discern a computational graph that we're trying to execute. And uh, the specifics aren't that important. But underneath the covers, we have a compiler called XLA that can take these graphs and then produce optimized code for different devices. Um, and this is all in our GitHub repository. Um, but the basic idea is, given that graph, we can now fuse different kinds of operations together. Because often you want to you know, do a matrix multiply and then do some nonlinearity to that and then take the output of that and feed it into some other vector operations. And we can look at that graph structure and generate code that does all of that with as efficient a, a set of code as possible. You know, not sending it out to memory and bringing it back in, but doing all the computation fused together in one, one uh, custom kernel. OK. Uh, let me talk a bit about machine learning for higher performance machine learning models. So for a lot of models, you actually want to take the computation and parallelize it across multiple different computing devices. Uh, maybe you have a machine with four GPUs in it, and you want to run, you run a single copy of the model across those four GPUs. Uh, but it's often non-trivial to figure out how you should map the computation onto those four uh, GPU cards. Um, so here's a simple sort of uh, diagram of the machine translation model I showed you earlier. And it has a couple of LSTM layers plus some attention computation and a softmax. And one straightforward uh, human design mapping that you might come up with is, well, I don't want the parameters for these layers to move. So I'm going to put everything uh, for the first LSTM layer on GPU 1 and then run every time step there. And then the second GPU will run second LSTM layer and so on. Now, <clears throat> It turns out that uh, we can use reinforcement learning to find an interesting placement of the computation. Uh, and actually, I will point out Azalia is a uh, proud uh, PhD student from Rice. Uh, she's been in our group for a little more than a year now. Um, and uh, so the idea here is we now have uh, a bunch of computational devices, and we have a computational graph. And we can use a machine learning model to make a bunch of placement decisions for the nodes in the graph. OK, this node should run on GPU 1, and this node should run on GPU 2, and this one on GPU 2 again, this one on GPU 4. And then we can measure how fast that placement runs. And we get relatively quick feedback. It takes us maybe 5 or 10 seconds to run the graph a couple times, average the step time. And now we can get a feedback signal for that placement algorithm. It, can say, oh, well, that was 2.2 seconds total. All the decisions you made, you know, you get some reward for that. And now you do it again, and you make a different set of placements, and now you ran it in 1.7 seconds. So uh, gradually, the system will learn to improve its placement decisions through that feedback signal. Um, yeah. And so it comes up with some pretty interesting placements. So uh, each color here is a different GPU, and the left-hand one is that translation model I showed you. Uh, and white is actually the CPU. So it's actually learned to interleave use of the CPU on the, on the system, plus kind of interleaving all the way, all the different GPU computations in a way that makes it roughly 20% faster than the best human design placement. And here is an image model uh, with um, you know, a different computational structure. Uh, again, each different color is a different GPU card. Um, this is not the design a human would come up with to parallelize this. Um, but again, it's about 20% faster than the human design placement. OK. Uh, <clears throat> let me touch on a few trends in some of our research that I think show the direction and the kinds of models that we want to be able to train. So first, I think we want much bigger models than we are training today. But we want them to be sparsely activated. So what do I mean by that? Well, 
first the motivation. We want to be able to remember a lot, but we don't want to pay the computational cost of activating the entire model for every example. Um, so we know that real brains do this by having different areas of, of expertise that are activated in different circumstances. So one of the things we've been doing is uh, learning. Uh, we've created a, a layer that you can insert into a neural net called the mixture of experts layer, uh, which has different experts, where an expert might be you know, a, a bunch of computation with a bunch of parameters. And we might have a lot of them. Uh, and that, oops, sorry. And then it has this gating network in green at the bottom that is going to decide for a given example which expert to activate. And it might activate only one or two out of the 2,000. So we're going to learn a pathway that is most effective for this kind of data. Um, and so you can see that it learns to route. These are examples that got routed to different experts. And you can see that it's learned different kinds of expertise. So this expert kind of is good at talking about researchers and generation and innovation and science. And this one's good at like playing a central role and like a vital role and leading role and that kind of thing. And this one's good at kind of quick adverbs. So they do exhibit different kinds of expertise. And so how, how well does this work? Well, if you take the translation model for the production Google Translate system on the bottom row here, uh, and let's focus on four columns. So the first one is test blue score. Blue score is a measure of translation quality. Uh, it's sort of uh, amount of overlap with human generated translations for the test set. And uh, there's about a one point improvement in blue score, which is quite significant. Um, one of the nice things is because we have all this capacity in these sparsely activated experts, we were actually able to shrink the amount of computation in the pink parts of the model substantially. So you see there's only about half as much computation per word, even though we have all these extra parameters. So we're essentially learning to route these uh, different examples uh, through these experts. And so there's obviously way more parameters in this model. We have 8 billion parameters instead of a quarter billion. Um, but the training time, because the computation per word is way lower, is roughly a tenth. 64 GPU days instead of you know, roughly 600 GPU days. Um, so that's a trend that I think is important, being able to route through a much bigger model and learning how to route uh, different examples. A second trend that I'm really excited about is uh, what I'll call automated machine learning, or learning to learn. So currently, the way you solve a machine learning problem is you have some data, and you have some computation. And then you take a human machine learning expert that sits down and thinks carefully about you know, what the problem is, what kind of model they should train, what learning rate you should use. They run a bunch of experiments. And you stir it all together, and you get a solution. Um, so can we automate some of this? Can we turn this into something where you have data and maybe a lot more computation, but you don't need as much machine learning expertise? And so we have early signs that this is you know, possible in some cases. So this is some work on essentially one of the problems when you're using deep learning is to say what model architecture should you train. Should you train a nine layer model with you know, this size convolutional filters and connect it this way, or a seven layer model? Um, and human machine learning experts spend a lot of time coming up with new and interesting architectures that work well for different problems. Um, here, we're going to have a model generating model. And we're going to train it via reinforcement learning. So the model generating model will generate a little description of the way a network, neural network architecture should look. And then we're going to generate 10 such examples. And we're going to train them all for a few hours. And now, after a few hours, we look at how well those are performing. And the ones that are performing well, and we use that as a reinforcement learning signal for the model generating model. So now, the ones will essentially steer the, the model generating model towards solutions that worked well and away from solutions that didn't seem to work very well. And uh, this actually works. So uh, it's just kind of at the boundaries of practical today for small problems. 
So CIFAR 10 is a very small image recognition task. It's, I think, 60,000 images that are very small, uh, color pictures of like uh, 10 categories of things, train, plane, and uh, horse, and things like that. Um, but the advantage is it's been well studied by the machine learning community. And so you can see over time, the error rate has been dropping as people improve the state of the art result. And the bottom four rows here are the neural architecture search uh, that uh, we've done here. Um, so we are got very close to the state of the art error result. In fact, that came out roughly concurrently with these results. Um, and here is an example of the best performing architecture, which looks kind of unlike uh, what you might see a human come up with in terms of architecture. It has much more organic structure. You know, it has these very large skip connections that go from layer you know, 7 up to layer 15. Um, and, but those skip connections are actually kind of interesting because the ResNet work there, for example, uh, third group from the bottom, uh, one of the big innovations in ResNet was to have this kind of structured skipping. You could essentially have every layer skip the layer above it or go through the layer above it. And so that's a much more structured form of the same principle of you want to have more direct pathways from the input to the output. Uh, looking at a different task, the Penn Freebank language modeling task, um, again, a well-studied thing. Here, the metric is perplexity, and so lower is better. Um, and what you see is we got actually better than the state of the art. And we came up with an interesting cell for a recurrent structure that is different than the more normally used LSTM cell. Um, and so it has, we gave it the same basic operations that make up an LSTM cell and said, go to it, assemble them however you want. And that's the cell it came up with. And interestingly, we then used that cell on a completely different task in uh, sequential medical uh, prediction task, and it performed better than an LSTM cell. Um, and more recently, we've been working on scaling this approach to ImageNet. And so every black dot there that you see is a sort of pretty significant research result that improved the state of the art uh, for ImageNet, um, done, typically done by a, a machine learning research group after you know, months or weeks of, of experimentation. Um, and the x-axis here is uh, the computational cost of the model. Sort of more expensive models generally give better accuracy. Accuracy is on the y-axis. But what you see is that all the black dots, which are human-generated machine learning models, are inside all of the red dots. Uh, that's true at the highest accuracy, high computation uh, point. So we're a little bit better in accuracy, but a lot cheaper in compute. 30% uh, cheaper in compute uh, with better accuracy. And it's true of the low end, where we are, have a very lightweight model that is significantly more accuracy accurate than the mobile net model, which is designed specifically to be very lightweight and run on phones effectively. So that's kind of exciting, right? That graph is, is interesting, I think. <coughs> OK, so what might a plausible future look like? So I think we can combine a lot of these sort of little pieces of ideas into something uh, that, that works pretty effectively together. So we want a large model, but we're going to sparsely activate it. Uh, we want a single model, I believe, to solve many different tasks, rather than what we're doing today, which is typically training a single machine learning model to do one thing and one thing only, and training the heck out of it so that it does really well at that, but it can't do anything else. I think in order to really build much more general systems, we want to be able to do lots of different things so that when a new thing comes along, we can actually come up with a plausible uh, good state fairly quickly without too many examples. And we want to dynamically learn and grow pathways through this large model, uh, sort of similar to how the network architecture search was working. I can imagine that we're searching for pathways through this large model. And then we're going to run it on like these custom ASICs that are super fast, and maybe map it efficiently onto the hardware using machine learning. OK, so here's a cartoonish diagram of, of how this might work. So imagine we just have a bunch of supervised tasks, where each different supervised task is in a different color at the bottom and top here. And we've learned a bunch of pathways through this model. And in particular, notice that some of these components in this, uh, in this large, sparsely activated model might be shared across multiple different tasks. 
Um, so that bottom thing there maybe does a good thing for all three of those uh, tasks, all uh, two of those tasks. And now a new task comes along, right? So I can imagine we can use reinforcement learning to essentially find a pathway that works pretty well for this new task from the representation we've already learned internally for solving other tasks, particularly if those tasks are, are somewhat related, or at least that task is somewhat related to some of the tasks we can do. And maybe we'll decide that this task is really important. We'll want to add some new capacity to the model for this task and augment the set of, of uh, components that we have so that we get more accurate results on that task. And then that component then becomes available for future searches over uh, you know, other new tasks or uh, existing tasks. So that's kind of a vague direction that I think makes sense for making these systems so that they're not just doing one thing, but so they're doing lots of different things. OK, so in conclusion, uh, I hope I've convinced you that deep neural nets are actually making significant improvements in a lot of areas that we care about, you know, in vision, in speech, in language, uh, in robotics, in healthcare. Many different areas are being affected by this. And they're also reshaping the kinds of computational infrastructure we want to run our computations on. Essentially, as, as Moore's law is stopping scaling of general purpose computation, we can specialize these co computational devices for the kinds of computations we want to run here. And that will make sense because a lot of the computations we want to run in the future are likely to be of this form. And so if you're not thinking about how deep neural nets can solve problems you care about, I think you really should be. My impression is that um, you always need to take a fixed amount of input, like fixed amount of fixed amount of set of coordinates into your system. Um, is it easy to extend this to take uh, varying amount of input sets? Is, is that an easy problem, or um, how would you suggest to? And that should be possible. But you should look at the blog post of the, uh, that had points to two research papers about the work. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe if you look at those, you'll be able to, to ascertain if it will work for your problem. One thing that uh, people are pretty good at is going from HPO terms to diseases. Uh, but we have a big issue moving from like doctor's notes to HPO terms. Is that something that you could see machine learning tackling? Uh, the human phenotype ontology. Uh so machine learning can definitely help with that, right? If you had a bunch of examples of note and then actual uh, code that you should use given that note, that's exactly the sequence to sequence problem, except the output sequences of length one. I'm actually coming uh, not from this school. I work in the industry. And um, uh, I'm, I have like some domain expertise. So my question is, wh what do you think in the future uh, how, how the main expert versus data scientists can adopt to this uh, new artificial intelligence technologies. Do you think that uh, the main experts can also um, be involved, or is it just the main of uh, data scientists? Anytime you have human insight and expertise in a problem, you should absolutely want to use that in a machine learning solution. So if you have a way of generating sort of domain expertise or a way of using your domain expertise to structure the solution for the problem, uh, often that's really useful. And it's really useful uh, when you have very little data or, or relatively small amounts of data, because that, that sort of extra expertise really uh, can get you to a point where you actually have a real solution rather than something where uh, you don't have a very good solution at all. Uh, I think if you have lots and lots and lots of data for a problem, the domain expertise becomes less important because that kind of structure emerges from the patterns that you see in the data. But there are many problems where we have very little data, and actually domain expertise is, is vital to solving them in the, for problems we care about. Much of the machine learning algorithms rely on linear algebra engines and convex optimization, which are iterative. And if you're solving them in a distributed way, some sort of synchronization has to happen. Um, and so as you know, people are talking about exascale machines, 1,000 cores and things like that, uh, a lot of time is spent on communicating and updating stuff. So what is the future you know, from your vantage point uh, in terms of computation of these algorithms? Uh, it turns out that neural nets are actually a little bit tolerant of some amount of asynchrony in these systems. So you can actually have 
a lot of copies of your model, each independently providing gradient updates that get uh, added together. And even if you don't do that in a completely synchronous manner, that generally works up to maybe a hundred or a few hundred copies of your model. Um, and the other thing is, uh, obviously, the more bandwidth you have, the better. And so the TPU pods, for example, are designed with very high-speed networks between the, 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 the boards to, uh, to essentially minimize the effects of becoming out of sync so you can synchronize more often. So both asynchrony and faster synchronization are good. Yes? Yes, I would like to ping your opinion on unsupervised type of uh, learning techniques. I saw in your talk uh, you emphasize on supervised and reinforcement learning. And in many cases, in many applications, we don't have access to labels. And we have to figure out ways to work with basically reduce number of labels. So I would like to see what are the efforts that in Google they are pursuing in terms of uh, trying to come up with good learning devices or procedures using just unsupervised, unsupervised or semi-supervised learning. For a new problem, you'll need much less supervised data because you have good representations that are very similar to the ones you want to solve this problem. And so you don't need as much data as like essentially learning from random floating point values, which is the way we start most problems today. So you mentioned machine learning on machine learning, but mostly in the context of neural nets. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had done um, any publications on the Kaggle acquisition, the machine learning models that you've got there, you know, the millions of those, because mostly they're very simplistic, right? They're more like decision trees or, or something of that nature. I haven't done machine learning on those models or done really any investigation, at least within our group. Uh, the Kaggle team is now part of our cloud uh, group, and so we we interact with them a little bit, but not they're not sort of directly sitting with us. Since for this deep learning, we need to use tons of data. And uh, should we just like 100% trust data that you have, or do you have some, you know, do some filtering or to, to think about the quality of data? A lot more data that's noisy uh, it is better than a very clean and refined, very small data set. Uh, for other problems, the noise is too, too much, and you would actually have rather have you know, human cleanup of the data or some augmentation of a very clean data set to augment the noisy data. So it really just depends. I don't have a good rule of thumb.